Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. I have a friend who sends me like historical tidbits and clips from old newspapers that he digs up from time to time. Usually these are things that are simultaneously interesting and kind of weird. Uh, Sometimes very weird. Uh, (laughs) Earlier this year, though, he sent a message about a, a reported murder from more than a century ago. And just from the details that trickled through over these texts, I thought, okay, that's got to go on the list. This is probably the most well-known among people from Texas and people who are affiliated with Rice University in Houston because it is the death of the university's founder and namesake, William Marsh Rice. Today, we are going to talk about how William Marsh Rice amassed a fortune big enough that he was basically able to establish an entire university by himself, and how that fortune also made him a target for murder. Although William Marsh Rice's namesake university is, of course, in Texas, he was born in Springfield, Massachusetts on March 14, 1816. His parents were David and Patty Hall Rice, and he was the third of their ten children, seven of whom survived infancy. William was named for the Reverend William Marsh, a Methodist circuit rider who established a Methodist Episcopal Society in that area in 1815. David and Patty were its first two members. David worked at the Springfield Armory, which was the United States' first federal arsenal. He also worked as a tax assessor and a tax collector and represented Springfield in the General Court of Massachusetts. Later in William's life, he wrote a letter in which he described his parents as very hardworking and devoted to their children and said that his father in particular had such a, quote, firm reliance upon providence that nothing seemed to lay heavy on his mind. While William was still a boy, Massachusetts passed a law requiring any town with 500 families or more to build a high school. William's father was on the committee that worked to build the school in Springfield, and the Rices were one of the families that financially contributed to its construction. So it seems like education was pretty important to them, and it would have made sense for William to have enrolled in the school when it opened. But there isn't any record of this, and the family lore is that at around age 15, he actually left school to work at a store. Rice turned 21 in 1837, and at that point, he had saved enough money to buy a store of his own. But that same year, a combination of factors triggered the panic of 1837. Rice's reasons for leaving Massachusetts after this aren't documented anywhere, but it's extremely likely that this business he'd started for himself suffered during this financial crisis. And at about the same time, people in the United States were hearing about cheap land and new business opportunities that were available in the Republic of Texas, including through advertisements that were intentionally trying to attract more Anglos to the area. In 1838, Rice moved to Texas, sending a load of goods to Galveston by sea so that he could set up a store there. He traveled by rail and then by packet ship so that he could meet up with it. Rice's cargo did not make it to Galveston, though. The ship that it was on was lost at sea, and this may have been a factor in his decision to move on from Galveston to Houston. Houston had been founded in 1836, and in 1837, it had been named the capital of the Republic of Texas. At that point, it was barely getting started as a city, and there were more tents than permanent structures. But Houston had obvious potential to become a bustling trading center. It was situated on Buffalo Bayou, which connected to the port of Galveston through Galveston Bay, so people from the surrounding area could send their goods overland to Houston, and from there it could be shipped out to the port of Galveston by water. In February of 1839, the Harrisburg County Board of Commissioners granted Rice 320 acres of land in Houston. And then that April, Rice got a contract to both supply and serve liquor at the Milam Hotel. He was paid the cost of the alcohol plus $3 a day and his board. This job might conjure up an image of somebody who really enjoyed or at least cared about alcoholic beverages, but Rice himself seems to have been a teetotaler. 
It was his job. Uh, it was a good business opportunity, clearly. He that seems, he just seems to have been like, what, whatever I can put my hand in to get right. some money going, it'll be good. Rice formed a series of business partnerships in the Houston area. One was with Barnabas Haskell in August of 1840. But that partnership seems to have fizzled out pretty quickly. Not long after, he became partners with Charles W. Adams. Their joint ventures included a sugar plantation. Around 1844, Rice started an import-export business with Ebenezer B. Nichols, who had fought against Mexico and against indigenous nations while serving in the army. And together, they did business as Rice and Nichols exporters, importers, and wholesale grocers of Houston. This business imported all kinds of stuff, basically anything that people living in Texas could want or need. But they exported mostly cotton, and this was true of Houston's other exporters as well. Houston's next biggest export at this point was hides, and once a sawmill was built in the 1840s, lumber joined cotton and hides, but both hides and lumber were way, way behind the amount of cotton that moved from Houston to Galveston and then out to other parts of the world. The Texas Constitution outlawed the chartering of banks. That was something that would continue until after the U.S. Civil War. So as Rice and his business partners became wealthy enough to do it, they started offering basic banking services in addition to their work as merchants and cotton brokers. Things like offering loans and lines of credit. Businesses in Texas couldn't issue currency, though, so when people needed it, they relied on U.S., Spanish, and Mexican currency, even though it wasn't always clear what their actual value should be. Because of this lack of a centralized currency, people also paid their debts in other ways as well. So some of Rice's clients paid him in land, and that, of course, added to his wealth. In 1845, Texas became a U.S. state, entering the Union as a slave state. At this point, the United States was trying to maintain a balance between free and slave states in the Senate. That balance was tipped slightly in favor of slave states until 1848, and that's when Wisconsin entered the Union as a free state. This was not just a political or theoretical issue for William Marsh Rice. The cotton industry, which was such a central part of his business, was profitable because of its exploitation of enslaved labor. And Rice wasn't simply exporting cotton and selling imports to enslavers. He was also acting as a cotton factor, loaning money to landowners and cotton growers in the window between when they delivered their crop and when they were actually paid for it, and also just handling other business for them. William's brother Frederick also owned a cotton plantation with an enslaved workforce of at least 35 people, and William both sold the cotton grown there and helped his brother to run that business. William was also more directly involved. He spent at least a year serving on a slave patrol, which worked to track down and return people who had liberated themselves from slavery. As part of this, he posted advertisements with physical descriptions of people who had escaped and offering rewards for their return. In addition to notices that he placed on other people's behalf, William's advertisements included ones for people who had escaped from him. William enslaved people for most of his time in Texas before the Civil War. In slave schedules from the 1860 census, he is listed as enslaving 15 people. Some had been given to him as payment for debts, and some had been part of land deals. He bought the land or took possession of the land as payment for a debt, and enslaved people who were made to work the land just came with it. He also purchased people directly, including a 17-year-old named Amanda who he bought at a public auction for $1,050. As another example, in 1848, he and Ebenezer Nichols were together enslaving a 17-year-old named Ellen and Ellen's one-year-old daughter. William transferred his portion of their ownership over to Ebenezer's son, Frank Rice Nichols, as a gift. Even though Rice participated in and massively benefited from the institution of slavery, some historians and biographers have concluded that he did not support the Southern states' secession over the issue, which of course launched the Civil War. His business dealings suggest that he understood how much power and wealth was really focused in the Northern states and with the federal government. 
He also had a nephew who served with the 37th Massachusetts Volunteers, who later suggested that one of the reasons Rice ultimately moved away from Texas was that he was suspected of having Northern sympathies. At the same time, though, in the early years of the war, Rice and his wife worked to raise money for and to otherwise support Confederate soldiers and their widows. And any statements that Rice made after the war was over about supporting the Union or rejecting the Confederacy really can't just be taken at face value. Once the war was over, it was absolutely in his best interest, personally and financially, to try to establish the idea that he had been pro-Union all along. I'm one of the good guys. Uh, We have gotten a little bit ahead of ourselves in the chronology of this discussion of William Marsh Rice's history as an enslaver. So we are going to take a quick break and then we're going to rewind a few years before the Civil War started. On June 29th of 1850, 34-year-old William Marsh Rice married 18-year-old Margaret C. Bremen, with newspapers describing their wedding at the Capitol Hotel as splendid. William bought them a house in Houston. This was actually one that his business partner, Ebenezer Nichols, had started building but not finished yet before deciding to move to Galveston to manage their operations there. At some point around this time, William also started attending an Episcopalian church rather than a Methodist church, possibly because Margaret was Episcopalian and the Nichols family were Episcopalians as well. In 1851, Rice helped establish the Houston and Galveston Navigation Company. After his brother Frederick moved to Texas, they established William Rice and Company. In 1858, William bought a brig he named the William M. Rice, which he used to import ice from Massachusetts. We are not sure whether this was connected to Frederick Tudor's ice business that we have covered on the show before. But he sold this ship at the start of the Civil War. Yeah, um, unfortunately, the Frederick Tudor book that might have had that information went back to the library years ago when I actually worked on that episode. Uh, And I I could not retrieve it again in the timeline for this episode. Anyway, uh, even though Rice doesn't seem to have had much formal education himself, he does seem to have been interested in the educational systems in the community where he was living. In 1857, he became a board member of the Houston Education Society. And in 1859, he became a trustee of the Ward Free School and of Texas Medical College, By this point, he had a reputation for being a skilled and reliable businessman. He had an estimated fortune of about $750,000, which made him one of the richest men in Texas. He was probably second only to sugar planter John Hunter Herndon, whose wealth primarily came from his huge land holdings and the workforce that he enslaved. Sometime before the start of the Civil War, Rice dissolved his partnership with Ebenezer Nichols. This seems to have been an amicable division of their business, with Nichols doing business in Galveston, while Rice focused largely on Houston. The U.S. Civil War started, of course, in 1861, and at first, Rice continued to run his business from Houston. He didn't join the Army. It sort of seems like it was kind of business as usual, sort of, except with the blockade and whatnot, at least at the beginning. But then his wife, Margaret, died on August 13th of 1863. After her death, William left Texas, where their home was used as a military hospital. He drew up a will, leaving everything to his brother, and then he went to Matamoros, Mexico. This had become a popular location for people who were trying to ship goods without having to use blockade runners to get through the Union blockade of Confederate ports. Uh, After the war... Rice claimed that he had never run the blockade. This leaves some unanswered questions. Like, he was able to essentially legally go around it from Mexico, but he was still in Houston for a chunk of the war. So it's not totally clear whether he was being honest when he claimed never to have used blockade runners. Probably not sitting on his hands during that time. Right. (laughs) Um, So regardless of that, As we said earlier, it was in his best interest to make it seem like he had been as law-abiding by union standards as possible. Uh, He stayed in Mexico until August of 1865. And of course, Rice faced some financial losses as a result of the war. Confederate currency and bonds were both worthless afterward. 
When applying for amnesty after the war, he claimed that he had been financially ruined. But really, he managed to protect a lot of his investments. He had gotten his brother to sell out his stock in Houston, and he had continued to trade in cotton and necessary goods from Mexico. He also had other investments besides the ones we've discussed, including plank roads and railroads. Rice went back to Houston, as we said, right after the war was over. But then not long after that, he moved to New Jersey, where he worked as an agent for Houston and Texas Railroad. In addition to the railroad, he kept a lot of business ties in Texas, including becoming a director of Houston Insurance Company in June of 1866. On June 26, 1867, Rice married Julia Elizabeth Baldwin Brown, known to family as Libby. She was the widowed sister of his brother Frederick's wife, and William had also acted as her late husband's agent. Although they got married in Houston, they went back east not long after the wedding, possibly because of a terrible yellow fever epidemic that struck Houston that summer. That epidemic killed nearly 500 people. It was the worst yellow fever epidemic ever to strike that city. Uh, For a lot of their marriage, William and Elizabeth lived primarily in New York and New Jersey. William bought a farm in Dunellen, New Jersey, and that eventually had an orchard, a dairy, and a smokehouse. They often spent winters in Houston, but there were years-long stretches where they didn't go back to Texas at all. This didn't seem to suit his wife, though. William really loved the farm, but Elizabeth wanted to have friends and social engagements and more amusements than were really available out in the country. Eventually, William got an apartment for them in Manhattan, and she seemed happier there, and from there she took on various charitable pursuits. In 1885, Rice also bought the Capitol Hotel in Houston, where they stayed when they visited, eventually having a suite built and furnished just for their use. In 1887 or 1888, Caesar Maurice Lombardi, who was president of the Houston School Board, came to Rice about funding a municipal high school. The city council was not really enthusiastic about the project. According to Lombardi, they thought high school was, quote, highfalutin nonsense. But as we've discussed, Rice was already involved in various educational institutions. His parents had been as well. But after considering this proposal, he decided that funding the high school was really the city's job, and he wanted to do something different. He decided to use his fortune to build the William M. Rice Institute of Literature, Science, and Art, This replaced an earlier idea that he'd been working on to fund an orphanage that would have been not far from his farm in New Jersey. Rice established a board of trustees, and on May 13, 1891, he provided a $200,000 endowment, quote, devoted to the instruction and improvement of the white inhabitants of the city of Houston and state of Texas, through and by the establishment and maintenance of a public library and institute for the advancement of literature, science, and art. Later that month, the Institute was incorporated. Under its Articles of Incorporation, it was to be devoted to the, quote, establishment and maintenance of a thorough polytechnic school for males and females designed to give instructions on the application of science and art to the useful occupations of life. This document also specified that the, quote, library, reading room, scientific department, and polytechnic school, and the instruction, benefits, and enjoyments to be derived from the Institute to be free and open to all. It was also specified that the school would be built only after Rice's death. I read some speculation that this was because the Capitol Hotel had turned into kind of a money pit and like a a maintenance nightmare, and that maybe he just didn't want to have to deal with something like that for his institute while he was alive. (laughs) When the Rices returned to New York later in 1891, it was to a larger, nicer apartment. In 1893, William drew up a will that left most of his fortune, which was estimated at about $4 million, to the Institute, with the rest divided up among various people, including provisions to make sure his wife had an income if she survived him. Elizabeth didn't outlive William, though. She got sick in the winter of 1895, and in the spring of 1896, they went to Houston, hoping that the warmer weather would help her. After they got there, though, she had what sounds like a stroke. Afterwards, she was paralyzed on her right side, and her cognitive abilities seemed to have been seriously affected as well. 
But then in June of 1896, Oren Thaddeus Holt drew up a new will for Elizabeth. Elizabeth's mother and sister witnessed it, and Holt was named as executor. This will claimed that Elizabeth was a resident of Texas, which meant that under the state's community property laws, half of William's estate would be hers to bequeath, even if William was still alive when she died. All of this was done without William's knowledge, and it is really not clear how involved Elizabeth was in the decision to do this or the terms of the will itself. But the terms of the will specified that the executor would receive 10% of everything that he received and paid out under its terms. Elizabeth's bequeathals added up to about $1.25 million, or twice that much if it turned out William's estate was worth more than expected. So that meant that as executor of this estate, Oren Holt stood to make at least $120,000, All of this seems shady. Deeply. (laughs) As the summer progressed in Houston, the heat seemed to make Elizabeth's condition worse, so the Rices went to a healing retreat in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Although Elizabeth did seem to fare a bit better in Wisconsin, the opposite was true for William. He went back to New York, something that he said was both ordered by a doctor and what his wife wanted. Elizabeth died on July 24th of 1896, at which point William still knew nothing about the will that Oren Holt had drawn up. When that will was admitted to probate in March of 1897, Rice filed suit, arguing that although they had been in Texas when this will was created, they were residents of New York, so Texas's community property laws did not apply. Around this time, Rice met a man named Charles Jones, who was known as Charlie. Charlie had been told to look after a trunk that had been sent from Waukesha to Houston, which belonged to the late Mrs. Rice. In the spring of 1879, when William returned to New York after filing suit in Texas, he took Jones with him as his valet. We will talk more about this after another sponsor break. Legal action over Elizabeth Rice's will went on for years. And during this time, William Marsh Rice mostly stayed in New York. He became increasingly solitary, maybe a little eccentric. He spent most of his time reading journals, writing lots of letters, trying to look after his health. He had developed some chronic digestive problems and seems to have been very focused on trying to stay as healthy as possible. Uh, He had folks in Houston looking after his business interests there. And in New York, his only real companion was his valet, Charlie Jones. Meanwhile, Oren T. Holt, who had drawn up Elizabeth Rice's contested will, was still trying to gather evidence to support his case that she should be considered a resident of Texas. This required investigations and interviews in Houston, New York, and New Jersey. And Holt realized that he just could not do it all by himself, so he hired another lawyer, Albert T. Patrick, to handle things in New York and New Jersey. Patrick's investigation naturally brought him into contact with Rice's valet, and Charlie Jones later testified that around the end of 1899, Patrick started convincing him that they should try to get some of Rice's fortune for themselves. In January of 1900, Walter Weatherby, who was a clerk at the bank that Rice used in New York, came to him and asked him for a loan. Jones eavesdropped on this conversation and later went to Weatherby, describing Rice as, quote, old and dopey, and claiming that he could get Rice to sign anything. Jones proposed that Weatherby draw up a new will for William Marsh Rice, which Jones would get him to sign. Weatherby did not take him up on this offer, but he also didn't tell anyone about it. Also in early 1900, Charlie Jones got sick, and Albert Patrick sent his doctor, Walker Curry, to treat him. Curry, who had served as a surgeon in the Confederate Army, prescribed a mercury tonic, Rice uh, decided to seek some treatment from Curry as well. At this point, Rice did not personally know Patrick, but he did know that Patrick was doing all of these investigations and relating to his wife's 
will. So Patrick told Curry that he had to keep their whole connection a secret from Rice. Meanwhile, Patrick was building a fake paper trail to make it look like he had an ongoing business relationship with Rice. Patrick pulled in Morris Myers and David Short, who were a notary and a commissioner of deeds that he knew, and they reported back to Patrick when they signed and notarized documents for Rice so that he could date his forgeries on the same day. Jones also mailed Patrick blank pieces of paper from Rice's apartment, and once Patrick received them, he replaced the blank paper with documents he had forged. He also started practicing Rice's signature. Jones typed up correspondence for Rice to sign, but he also brought some of those unsigned documents for Patrick to do. Then, in the summer of 1900, Patrick drew up a new will for William Marsh Rice, one that left most of Rice's fortune to him rather than to the William M. Rice Institute of Literature, Science, and Art. So at this point, Rice was 84 years old. He had chronic digestive trouble and some difficulty walking thanks to an old knee injury. He had actually jumped off of a moving train after realizing that he had accidentally slept through his stop, and that was the source of that problem. Dr. Curry described him as weak, with swelling in his hands and feet, a sluggish heartbeat, and some hearing loss. But Rice aspired to live to be as old as his grandfather, Josiah Hall, who had died at the age of 101. Jones later testified that in about August of 1900, Patrick started suggesting that they try to speed things along with Rice. But this timeline might not really be accurate. Jones's brother back in Texas had also started buying chloroform and sending it to the men in New York back in July. Regardless of the details of this timeline, though, Jones testified that on Patrick's instructions, he had started giving Rice the mercury pills that Curry had prescribed to him earlier in larger doses than were intended, eventually giving him so many of these pills that Patrick had to get some more. At first, Rice seems to have thought these pills that Jones was dosing him with were helping to improve his health. Then on September 8, 1900, a hurricane struck Galveston, Texas. This storm was catastrophic and deadly. It killed at least 6,000 people and possibly even twice that number. It also caused enormous property damage, completely leveling much of Galveston, including buildings that William Marsh Rice owned. This is sometimes described as the worst natural disaster in U.S. history, and it is covered in our prior episode, Five Historical Storms. Rice still had business interests in Houston and in Galveston. And then to make things worse, on September 16th, a fire broke out at the Merchants and Planters Oil Company, which was a cottonseed mill that Rice owned. Rice authorized manager Henry Oliver to draw up to $150,000 from his accounts to pay for repairs. All of this was financially catastrophic for Rice and all of the associated stress and trauma aggravated his already difficult digestion. After a friend stopped by and told him that bananas always helped her when her digestion was bad, he went way overboard and he ate nine bananas a day. That made him feel worse. (laughs) And he took even more of those mercury pills that Jones had given him to try to fix it. We've talked on the show before that mercury was sometimes used as a medicine. Uh, not a great idea. He, at this point, had taken a lot of it, but Rice was still alive. And Patrick was apparently terrified that if he did not die soon, he would spend his entire fortune trying to rebuild in Texas, and that would make that forged will worthless. So according to Jones's testimony, on Sunday, September 23rd, 1900, Patrick gave him some poison to serve to Rice in a tea. Rice actually found it too bitter and spit it out. By this point, Rice was pretty weak, and Jones carried him to bed. Jones later testified that, following Patrick's instructions, he dosed Rice with two ounces of chloroform in a sponge, wrapped in a towel that had been pinned in the shape of a cone. After about 30 minutes, he confirmed that Rice was dead, and he retrieved and burned the sponge and towel. Then, Patrick came into the apartment, posing as Rice's legitimate lawyer, He told the undertaker who arrived that Rice wanted to be cremated and that the cremation should happen the next day. 
Jones had actually laid some of the groundwork for this, getting some pamphlets on cremation and staging them on Rice's desk. There was also a letter, which was probably forged, in which Rice purportedly requested to be cremated. When the undertaker explained that it was not possible to start the cremation process so quickly, Patrick ordered Rice's body to be embalmed in the interim. By this point, Dr. Curry had also arrived, and he got a blank death certificate from the undertaker. He filled it out with the cause of death of old age and weak heart, immediate cause indigestion followed by colocotu diarrhea with mental worry. That's not real. It's not a real word, yet. I, <laughs> I tried to figure out what what Curry meant by colocotu diarrhea, which because it's not even an order of letters that would work in English. Uh, I don't I don't really know. At first, Rice's death didn't really strike people as suspicious, given his age and his health. But the next day, David Short, that commissioner of deeds that Patrick had been working with, tried to cash a check for $25,000 at S.M. Swenson & Sons Bank. But the clerk at the bank thought something was amiss. Number one, Rice did not typically write checks that large. Uh, number two, the check was made out to Albert T. Patrick, but it was endorsed Albert T. Patrick. The clerk refused to process the check and short left, returning a bit later with a check that had all of the names spelled correctly. <laughs> the clerk still was not convinced and called Rice's apartment at the Berkshire and got Jones on the phone. Jones was evasive, but eventually told the clerk that Rice was dead. Eric Swenson, who was one of the sons in S.W. Swenson and Sons, went to an attorney, and they sent word to Houston about Rice's death. Rice's Houston attorney, James A. Baker, contacted Rice's brother, Frederick, and the two of them left for New York. When they got there, Albert Patrick produced the will that he had written back on June 30th, which left Rice's Institute only $250,000, less any money it had received up to that amount. Thanks to Rice's earlier endowment and the interest that it had accrued, this will would have left the Institute with nothing additional from Rice's estate and instead left most of the estate to Albert Patrick. Patrick claimed that this was because Rice was, quote, tired of life and tired of business. Right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Rice's actual attorneys and his brother went to the district attorney, who ordered an autopsy. This was carried out on September 24th, and Rice's body was cremated on the 25th. At this point, there was all kinds of speculation in newspapers that Rice had been murdered for his money. And this coverage became increasingly sensationalized, especially as various members of Rice's extended family, including people that he had not spoken to in decades, if ever, started giving statements to the press saying that they were penniless. On October 4th, Albert Patrick and Charlie Jones were both arrested for forgery for that $25,000 check that was originally spelled wrong, for the forged will, and for various other forged checks. And then on the 27th, the coroner's office issued its report in Rice's autopsy. The coroner said that there was enough mercury in his organs to have caused his death, plus a lot of arsenic, although they attributed the arsenic to the embalming fluid. Uh, later on, there were medical experts who talked about um, the effect of chloroform on his lungs. It doesn't seem to have been part of the actual coroner's report at this point. When the coroner's report came out, Charlie Jones told prosecutors he wanted to make a statement. And he gave a full confession to everything he and Patrick had done, although he said that Patrick was the one who had killed Rice with chloroform. Soon, Morris Myers and David Short were arrested for their involvement as well. Before long, though, it became clear that Albert Patrick could not have been the one who gave Rice chloroform. He had eaten dinner that night at his boarding house, and then he had been in the parlor singing hymns with some of the other people who lived there before they all went to a religious meeting. He basically had an alibi. After hearing this, Jones confessed that it was he, not Albert Patrick, who had chloroformed William Marsh Rice. As all of this was happening, Orrin Holt settled the lawsuits related to Elizabeth Rice's will out of court. 
William Rice's murder had added a whole other layer of complication, and it had become clear that he could not build an airtight case that she should have been considered a resident of Texas. Albert T. Patrick was tried for murder and was found guilty on March 26th of 1902. He was sentenced to death. And the media spectacle surrounding all of this got another jolt a couple of days later when he announced his engagement to Mrs. Addie Francis, who owned the boarding house where he lived. He made that announcement, of course, from prison. Two months later, when past podcast subject Hetty Green was granted a permit to carry a pistol, she told reporters that it was for her own protection, citing, among other things, the case of William Marsh Rice. Do you suppose Valet Jones would have molested him if he knew Mr. Rice had a pistol? Of course he would not have done so. I don't want evil-disposed people to repeat that sort of thing on me. On April 29th of 1904, All the legal and probate issues were settled surrounding William Marsh Rice's will, and the Rice Institute trustees got $4,631,259.08. But Albert Patrick's family and supporters maintained his innocence. They brought in expert witnesses who testified that Charlie Jones's story just did not add up. Among other things, if Rice had been chloroformed as Jones described, the people who came into the apartment and examined the body would have been able to smell it. After years of ongoing legal proceedings, Patrick's sentence was commuted on December 20th, 1906, and he was pardoned in 1912. He died in 1940. Charlie Jones was not charged in Rice's murder, A lot of the statements that he gave to police contradicted one another or were implausible for various reasons. And at one point, he had tried to take his own life while in custody. Ultimately, though, he was released. He seems to have gone back to Texas with his brother, and he took his own life there in 1954. Most accounts of all of this describe Rice's death as a homicide, with Jones and Patrick both directly involved in it. But in The Death of Old Man Rice, which was published by New York University Press in 1994, Martin L. Friedland describes being certain that Patrick was guilty before he started researching the book, but then becoming more doubtful as his work went on. Friedland consulted medical experts who raised doubts and pointed out inconsistencies between Jones's testimony and how chloroform actually works. Some of these were the exact same points that Patrick's defense team and expert witnesses had made back in the early 1900s. It is possible that Marsh was already dead when Jones tried to chloroform him, or that his account of the chloroform was fabricated. The forgery is easier to substantiate at this point. Yeah, it it seems pretty clear to me that there was definitely a plot going on to take his money, maybe also to try to hasten him toward death with the mercury pills. The chloroform has some question marks around it. Uh, Since he was cremated, it will never conclusively be known at this point. The William Marsh Rice Institute for the Advancement of Letters, Science, and Art, now William Marsh Rice University, opened on September 23rd, 1912. A statue of William Marsh Rice, which is referred to around campus as Willie, was erected at the university in 1930, and Rice's ashes were placed under it. In more recent years, there has been a student-led movement to remove this statue because of Rice's enslavement of other people and because he established the university specifically as a whites-only institution. When Rice drew up his will, people generally framed the United States as having two races, black and white. So while the university did enroll other non-black people of color earlier in its history, it specifically excluded black students for decades. It wasn't until 1963, after years of advocacy by students and pressure from outside the university and things like Brown versus Board of Education, the university trustees started trying to find a way out of that whites-only clause in Rice's will. This ultimately involved a court case, one that sought to overturn both the whites-only clause and Rice's stipulation that the university would not charge tuition. That court case was ultimately successful, and the university's charter was also revised to reflect both of those changes. 
Although Rice had also specified that this institution would be devoted to, quote, the city of Houston and state of Texas, out-of-state and international students had been admitted almost from the start. Rice University's first known Black student was graduate student Raymond Johnson, who was admitted in 1966 and earned a Ph.D. in mathematics in 1969. The first Black undergraduates at Rice were Linda Faye Williams and Theodore Marshall Henderson. They both graduated in 1970. And that is the murder kind of question Maybe. mark. <laughs> William <laughs> Marsh Rice. <laughs> Do you have listener mail that is not a question mark? I do. I do. I mean, it still has question marks, though. I picked a listener mail that has some question marks. This is from Liam. Uh, and Liam wrote a note that said, Hello, ladies. I just listened to your Friday episode. It was the Friday episode behind the scenes where we talked about gin. Uh, and you talked about the KLM houses. I'm very fortunate that pre-COVID, I flew to the U.S. from the U.K. with work and KLM were usually the second best choice of route, but always cheaper, so often what I ended up on. So I have a small collection, and yes, I have the app, and yes, people go nuts. They bring them around on a little tray, and many people ask them to turn the tray around so they can see the numbers to check them off in their app. Anyway, the point in writing, KLM were taken to court over the houses once, Under Dutch law, gifts are taxable, and the government argued that these were gifts to some passengers. KLM's defense was that actually, no, these aren't gifts. Because they are filled, it's actually a farewell drink served in a special container. If the passengers choose not to drink it and take it home, that's up to them. It was a successful defense. Even though I've never seen anyone open their house, which KLM absolutely know, they seal them in those fancy bags if you're connecting so you can bring your liquids through, Some of them go on eBay for hundreds of dollars, but only if it's not been opened. Uh, And because I know you love kitties, here's our three-legged rescue pogo. Um, My printer attempted to print the picture of pogo, but it's so big (laughs) that it did not work out. Uh, Liam says, thanks for all the many hours of lifelong learning. I love this story, and I tried to go learn more about this. And it's a little vague exactly what happened um, with the legal questions about the Delft Blue houses um, that KLM gives out to passengers. The most authoritative source I found was the KLM blog, um, which described this as being not so much about taxes, but, but about the idea that airlines were not allowed to give passengers incentives. And basically saying, uh, is there some law that says that alcohol has to be served in a glass um, to uh, build a case for the idea that this is a this is a container and not a gift? Um, I found some sources that claim that this was related to uh, U.S. airline deregulation in the 1970s. I was not able to find, like, actual detail about it in the time allowed before recording today's episode. But regardless, uh, even if this does turn out to be kind of like an apocryphal myth-making story around the KLM houses, I still find it delightful. So thank you, (laughs) Liam, uh, for this email and for the kitty picture. If you'd like to send us a note, we're at HistoryPodcast at iHeartRadio.com. We are also... All over social media at Missed in History. That is where we will find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and wherever you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 